Welcome to my channel. Today we will learn about making modern coins. The increase of mining activity in Central Europe during the 15th century gave a great impetus to the development of modern minting processes. The dyes themselves were still made by punches, but these, in turn, had become much more sophisticated, often embodying a complete portrait of the monarch. Their general shape depended on the striking process employed, but the material used was a steel that could be hardened by carburizing, putting iron in a bed of carbon in a sealed airtight box, and thence into a furnace, where the carbon diffused into the outer layers, after the designs had been punched in, or sunk. The metal for the coins was cast as ingots, a typical size being 1 half times 1 times 20 inches. These were then passed between steel rollers, powered by a water mill or horse gin, a mechanism that translated horsepower into rotational energy, to reduce the thickness. Several passes and annealings were necessary to obtain the correct thickness. The blanks, particularly for the larger crown-sized coins being introduced, continued to be roughly cut with shears from the rolled fillet, a metal strip, so that, as previously, they could easily be adjusted for weight before being rounded in rouleau. In some cases, however, they were punched by a machine from the fillet to a fixed diameter, so that the thickness was critical for controlling weight. To protect against clipping, during the next century a security edge was sometimes rolled onto the blank. This might consist of an inscription or a serrated or milled edge. Hand-operated screw presses were developed for stamping the designs on the blanks, although the blanks originally were centered on the lower die by eye, it soon became clear that a locating collar would prevent off-center striking. Such a method was used by Benvenuto Cellini, who struck coins for Italian princes in the first half of the 16th century, and it was then introduced first to Paris and then to London in the 1550s. At the same time the roller press was under development in Germany. Initially, the die designs were engraved or punched into the curved surfaces of two rollers that were geared together so that the whole fillet, rather than single blanks, could be fed between them and emerge impressed. This method was advantageous in requiring less power, only part of the blank was being deformed at any one time, and so, as compared with the screw press, the stresses on the machine were reduced. Because of imperfections, the fillet and the finished coins as punched out were markedly curved, and the coins required flattening, planishing, by light tapping with a smooth-faced hammer. The difficulty of taking out the complete rollers from such a press led to an ingenious variation, the taschenwork. In this machine the rollers were replaced by rectangular shafts pierced in the middle to take a pair of dies with tapered extensions, tangs. The axis of the upper shaft could be raised or lowered a short distance to accommodate variations in the dies or differing coin thicknesses. Such machines continued to be used in Germany into the 18th century. The rocker press represents another variation. The bottom roller, actually a quadrant insert, as in the taschenwork, remained stationary. The axis of the upper roller rotated about this lower axis as a small circle around a larger, so that the upper die face rolled over a stationary fillet that had been positioned over the lower die. One such mechanism, now in the British Museum, produced minor copper coins in Spain soon after 1600. The prolific Jean Warren, one of the great engravers, finally established the use of the fly press, a variation on the screw press in which the helix angle of the screw was much increased. The rotational arms ended in heavy weights that were swung with great velocity by two operators, working for only 20 minutes in each hour, and the elasticity of the system caused a rebound of the arm to its original position after the coin had been struck. Again, with a team of moneyers, a rate of production of a coin every second or so could be achieved. In some Russian mints of about 1800 a guided dropping weight functioned in much the same way, regaining its original position partly by rebounding and partly by operators pulling on return ropes running over pulleys. What do you think of our video? Let me know in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video make sure to hit that like button. Also, subscribe to our channel before you go. Thank you for watching.